it's fight terrorism now or face a catastrophe. That's John Howard's position, his justification for going in hard against Saddam Hussein. And it doesn't stop there. If we don't deal with Iraq, there'll be no stopping other rogue states like Korea. Well, I've just returned from the Korean Peninsula, and that's certainly the feeling in the South where they face the prospect of a nuclear-armed enemy just across the border. At the moment, there's a tense standoff. On one side, the North's Kim Jong-il going ballistic, threatening all-out war. On the other, the South Koreans and the Americans preparing for the worst. Here in South Korea, they're on permanent red alert. 700,000 crack troops backed by 37,000 Americans. Officially, there's been a ceasefire between North and South Korea for 50 years, but technically, they're still at war. Warrior Oscar, this is Warrior 5. I wanted to get a sit rep on uh, Iron's movement toward the... Uh, Colonel Dan Bolger is Chief of Staff of the US 2nd Infantry Division. This is his third tour of duty in Korea. And as the war of words between America and the North gets nastier, he's seriously worried about the threat of open conflict. Uh, if it comes, what we want to do is do it, do it as fast as we can and do it as effectively as we can and get it over with make sure that, that the Republic of Korea stays safe. So how dangerous is this place? This spot right here is the most dangerous place on the face of the planet. More dangerous than Iraq? More dangerous than Iraq. Captain Brian Davis is based right on the front line, on the border between South and North Korea. Also, all the soldiers up here are locked and loaded, meaning that they have a round chambered in their weapon, ready to go. This is what divides the two Koreas. The demilitarized zone cuts the entire peninsula in half. Now, in most places, the two sides are separated by a four kilometre wide no man's land. But here in Pan Munjom, where North meets South, they're within metres, within snarling distance. And when you think about it, that face off seems fairly farcical. But the military might it represents is really frightening. This is as close as most people get to North Korea, probably the most isolated, paranoid and belligerent nation on Earth. That grey block over there is in the north. These blue huts are neutral ground. And this concrete strip is the actual dividing line between the two enemy states. You're surrounded right now on three sides by communist North Korea. In your vision of sight right here, you're looking at 65,000 North Korean troops and behind these hills, dug into the back of these hills, are 3,000 tubes of North Korean artillery, all of them with the ability to put chemical rounds into downtown Seoul. You've got no doubt about that? No doubt about that. If the worst does happen, North Korea lobs a missile here into Seoul, what do you think will happen? Worst case scenario. They are talking about one million dead people in the very first 24 hours of this war. Dr. Norbert Wollitzen is one of few Westerners to see exactly what's going on in North Korea. He lived and worked there for 18 months and was granted special privileges, freedom to travel around the countryside. The main danger in this military mass, for sure, is that there will be some stupid people, maybe even Kim Jong-il himself or his top advisor, who will press this bottom and then there will be a nuclear disaster here. Dr. Wollitzen saw the North Korean military build up firsthand and watched Kim Jong-il, the man they call dear leader, in action. I think he is an upgraded version of Hitler, Stalin, Milosevic, Pinochet, all the dictators on Earth together. How are the people of North Korea suffering? The worst thing is maybe using human beings like guinea pigs in concentration camps where they are developing biological weapons. And I'm absolutely sure that they are 
producing weapons of mass destruction. I'm absolutely sure that they are starving their own people. I'm sure that there are concentration camps. And here's the evidence. Dr. Volitson's personal videos of the daily horrors he encountered in North Korea. Starving children left to die. And here you can see the normal children in a North Korean children's hospital. I thought, I'm in Auschwitz because of these blue and white striped pajamas. I thought, these are exactly the people who were imprisoned there in Dachau, Auschwitz or Treblinka. And I was shocked, especially as a German. Dr. Volitsen is now based in South Korea. He was thrown out of the North for trying to expose the tyranny of Kim Jong-il and the plight of his people. Mainly I, I thought they are there because they are victims of this political system. I gave a promise when I was standing in front of those children and I looked into their eyes, into their sad eyes, then I thought I have to do something, I have to speak out, I have to change and I, I, I will, will never stop. What do you think has happened to these children? I do not know. And I, I'm very much afraid that they're maybe all dead. We know there's been a terrible famine in North Korea. Two million are believed to have perished. More than half the population doesn't have enough to eat. But Dr. Volitsen is convinced that this is a deliberate, man-made disaster. There's no need for this sort of famine because there's foreign aid since several years now going to North Korea. Millions and billions of dollars are going to North Korea and I never saw those food aid and those medical equipment going to the countryside but only to the elite in North Korea. They are starving those people who are in opposition and I, I will call it genocide. This is the North. This is South Korea. The more you see and hear, the more difficult it is to believe that they're the same people. Sometimes the same families, divided by politics and barbed wire. No, North Korea is in a hungry wolf. A hungry? Wolf. Wolf. Yeah. North Korea, South Korea, rich, fat dog. Kim Myong Chol is the face of North Korea in the West, recognised as their unofficial spokesman. North Korea has minimum one, uh, 100 nuclear weapons. North Korea may have another six by the end of September. Mr Kim lives in Japan and says he's briefed regularly on the military situation in the North. His pronouncements might be laced with bravado, but he does give a unique insight into the way North Koreans think. Many people say what North Korea is doing is a suicide mission. I disagree totally. This is suicidal for America, for, for America. Bush, for North Korea. This is a march for victory. And what if they fail? What happens to North Korea? There is no failure. Kim Jong-il has one of the biggest armies in the world, over a million in uniform right now. And last year, North Korea admitted it had a secret plutonium program, setting off this latest crisis with the United States, a crisis that has Colonel Dan Bolger's troops on full alert. I think the reason that people have taken notice this time has to do with the fact that uh, they brought up a new thing into the equation that really hasn't been here for a while, and that is the, uh, the nuclear threat. And whenever you begin to mention nuclear arms or threaten the use of, of nuclear warfare, that clearly gets people's attention because it's not a local effect. And for once, Kim Myong Chol agrees. Prime targets for North Korean nuclear missile is uh, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. North Korea yes. now has the capability of course. to hit those cities. Yes. It, there is no shelter for Bush. There is no shelter for Bush. Is this rhetoric or fact? This is a fact. The best way to prove this, start war. You're saying bring it on. Yeah. That may well be wishful thinking, but Colonel Bolger believes the threat from the north is genuine. And even Australia could be in the line of fire because of our close ties with America. So we could be a target. You could be. But I think the key point is that uh, you can be part of being ready and put these guys on notice that nobody needs to be a target. We can solve this another way. So if they have the will, do you think they have the way to reach Australia? 
I believe that they're working to develop both. And I think uh, the will, as I said, is in the, minds of, in the mind of one guy and the small number of people around him. And uh, he's certainly shown evidence that he's willing to try some things that would be very dangerous. So why now and why so provocative? There are those who say it's brinkmanship. Kim Jong-il, the opportunist, is simply taking advantage of the fact that the world's attention is focused on Iraq. I think they are paper tigers with their nuclear threat in order to get some, yeah, some award to, to act in this blackmailing strategy and this brinkmanship to get some more food aid, to get some more attention, maybe a peace treaty or some non-aggression pact to stabilize their country and to, to manage to keep in power. Right now we have to take them at their word that they want that capability. And it would certainly be a significant addition to their arsenal if they got it. But I would remind you that their arsenal right now is plenty strong and plenty big of a threat to us. Do you understand why America doesn't want to deal with North Korea? They're afraid of us. So it's about fear. It's not because they don't want to sit down with a dictator who's a liar and a cheat. No, no. They're afraid of talking with North Korea. Because North Korea take, talking justice and truth. They are talking injustice, doing injustice. They are not confident. If you're North Korean, these are some of the things you would know about your dear leader. Kim Jong-il is a genius. As a university student, he taught the teachers. He's musically gifted, writing six operas in two years. And on the sports field, he's unbeatable. Now, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of exaggeration, but Kim Jong-il has his finger on the button. What sort of a man is Kim Jong-il, in your opinion? He's very... I say the canny fox. Canny fox is very calculating. Cunning fox, very yes. calculating. Yeah. He's not evil? Oh, he's not evil man. In my view, it's absolute evil. I never witnessed such a um, intensified form of brainwashing all over the world. And all the children in, in in the kindergarten, even when they are two years old, they are singing and praising Kim Jong-il the whole day long, from six o'clock in the morning up to 10 o'clock in the evening. They are learning mathematics in school at the age of five by counting North Korean tanks who will attack and destroy U.S. armies. And they are worshipping North Korean leader in an incredible way. <laughs> And here, along the demilitarized zone, you get a sense of what's at stake. So that's where the enemy is, out there, yeah. yes? Can I have a look through this? Yeah. yeah. The hatred is a fact, so is Kim Jong-il's unpredictability. Add the threat of nuclear weapons, and there's the very real potential for catastrophe. At a certain point, a person has to make a decision as to whether it's worth their life, what they're about to do. And all the rhetoric, and all the, uh, the political speeches and such in the world melt away on the battlefield. And at the end, you end up fighting for your mates on the right or the guy on the left. And my question will be, on this peninsula, who's going to have that will and cohesion in these hills, in this weather, to, to stick it out? And I'll tell you, it'll be our guys, just as it was the last go around. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9Now app.